Hey friend, welcome back. This is the Space Between YouTube series in which we are exploring the space between the Hebrew and the Christian scriptures. Uh, last week, you may remember, we were delving into this brief but energetic period of Jewish history um, in which they were actually a free and independent nation, and they were ruled by what we call the Hasmonean dynasty. Last week, we talked about this power couple of Alexander Janaeus, who was a kind of a power-hungry, bloodthirsty king who did all kinds of things that maybe he shouldn't have done and oversaw this bloody civil war between the Sadducees and the Pharisees. This is the guy who crucified 800 Pharisees and had killed their families in front of them and then had some banquet with his concubines and laughed while it was happening. Like, that guy. And then his wife, Salome Alexandra, who was the exact opposite, who was of the opposing political party, too, and she was a great negotiator and diplomat, and she started to make peace between the Pharisees and the Sadducees. She put the, Sad the, the Pharisees in positions of power. She built fortified cities for the Sadducees so that they could have some sense of peace, and it looked like maybe she was going to be able to bring about a period of peace and prosperity. But I teased you at the end there that these sorts of things don't always last. And she had two sons. One of them was a mild-mannered, peace-loving Pharisee named Hyrcanus II. The other one was a more brash and commanding and popular Sadducee named Aristobulus II. And when she died, she put her canis, um, she set it up so that he would become the, the ruler after she died. He had already been the high priest for a long period of time. And he lasted as the ruler of Judea for three months. <laughs> yeah, it only took three months for his brother Aristobulus to make a run for the throne. And him being the more skilled one in war and, you know, he's a Sadducee. And they just so happen to have all of these fortified cities they can use. Um, he won handily. In fact, a lot of of Hyrcanus's army deserted him and went over to his brother's side. So after a short war between the two of them, peace was, um, was attained. And Aristobulus got the title of ruler, and he also got the title of high priest, and Hyrcanus was allowed to live. That seemed pretty good, right? And he was also given um, a stipend for the rest of his life. He would be taken care of so that he didn't have to worry so much because he was, after all, the ruler's brother and the former high priest. This kind of seemed like it might be a fairly good situation now where the brothers were at peace and maybe there wouldn't be so much war. Ugh, but then a certain Antipater, I'm going to ask the guy's name, Antipater, well, he started whispering in Hyrcanus' ear. He started saying, you know, your brother, Aristobulus, he, he, he acts like, like he, he wants peace, but he doesn't really. He's actually plotting to kill you because he's afraid of you. He's afraid of your strength and your power because he knows that you are the rightful heir of the kingdom. And so he's going to try to kill you. And so you must flee. Come with me and we will flee together. And then we will mount a, a rebellion against your brother. And then we will retake the throne that is rightfully yours. And this guy Antipater was so convincing. And he was so politically savvy that it worked. And um, something else that I should mention is that he was the governor of Idumea. Now... If Idumea sounds familiar, it's because we talked about it a couple of weeks ago. Um, uh, maybe two or three weeks ago at this point, um, when Hyrcanus II's grandfather, John Hyrcanus, became the ruler of, of Judea, he was the first one to rule over the free peoples of Judea without any outside influence. And he took the opportunity to conquer all of the surrounding tribes around him. Do you remember this guy? 
And he's the one that burned down the temple in Samaria. He's also the one that forced people to convert to Judaism. He had them circumcised and they had to follow all of the laws and the sacrifices and all of that if they wanted to remain in the land. And so Idumea was one of those places. It was just south of Jerusalem. And the inhabitants of Idumea came under the jurisdiction of Judea. And by circumcision and by birth, they were technically Jews, though not by lineage. They had no direct lineage to Abraham and all of that. And so they were kind of like, if, if Judea was the children of Israel, they were like the stepchildren of Israel. It's kind of this very weird position where they're both Jews, but not Jews. And they're in, but they're not in. They're circumcised, but it doesn't really matter. Um, so this guy, Antipater, he was one of them. And he was the governor of Idumea. And so they ran off to Idumea together and they staged this coup. And it was so successful that nobody was winning. And both sides, plus a third side that just wanted to do away with the kingship altogether, petitioned to Rome to please just come in here and help us. Just decide. Just help us figure out who should be the rightful independent king of Judea. And man, did they ever come in and sort things out? This reminds me, when I was a kid and my mom would tell me to clean my room and then I wouldn't, and she'd say, clean your room, and then I wouldn't, and she'd say, clean your room, and then I wouldn't, and then she'd say, if you don't clean your room, I'm going to clean your room, and if I clean your room, you won't like it because I'm coming in with a trash bag. And that's kind of like what Rome did. (laughs) They came in with a trash bag, and they just said, you know what, you all can't handle independence, and now it's ours. See, when they first made these treaties with Rome um, during the Maccabean period, earlier on, like 100 years ago, Rome was still a good, thriving republic. Rome had been a republic for 500 years, a government of the people, by the people, mostly concerned with what was happening over there in modern-day Italy. But the rise of these powerful generals during this time period, plus a lot of of corruption among the wealthy elites in Rome itself, um, and the whole Mediterranean saw them teetering towards authoritarianism, And this one general named Pompey, well, he had designs for global dictatorship. And he's the one who steps in in Judea and says, you know what? None of this. I'm in charge now. And the next 30 years, um, which are going to pass by very quickly, are going to see this hectic power grab in Rome um, between these generals, the likes of which you may have heard, like Pompey and Julius Caesar and Crassus and Augustus and Mark Antony and Cleopatra. And they'll all be vying for control, all in the name of preserving the Republic. But none of them actually plan to preserve the Republic. They all just want to be dictators, which is pretty clear from how they handled it when they won. Um, But Judea is going to be right in the middle of all of this. It's in a really great location in between Egypt and Asia. It's, It's this great port on the Mediterranean. It's a great staging ground for military. It's just a really good location. And so we're going to see Judea actually become an important people group during this time. And what the leaders are going to start doing here is they're going to start picking generals that they like, that they think will win, and that offer them good terms, and they're going to support them. But then when it seems like the tide is shifting, they're going to switch allegiances really quickly to the other side and support them and hope that they support them back. And this is what happens right here. Um, Because at first, when Pompey came in, um, he installed Hyrcanus II back in the role as high priest. So he gets to be high priest again. He doesn't really even want to be ruler, so he doesn't mind that. And they install our good friend Antipater as the governor of Judea because he was already the governor of Idumea and he's doing such a great job. We might as well just give him a little bit more territory. So now we have this Idumean who is in charge of Judea and Hyrcanus gets to be um, high priest again. But then Pompey and Julius Caesar start to go at it, and 
Pompey gets killed in Egypt, and Julius Caesar looks like he's going to be the one who pulls ahead, but he's having a hard military time in uh, down in Egypt. So um, Antipater sends 3,000 Jewish troops down to Egypt to help Julius Caesar and also to try to win his favor because it seems like Julius Caesar is going to be the guy who's going to be in charge, and we want to get out ahead of this and pick the winner of this uh, of of this fight. And so for his kindness, Caesar gave Judea special treatment. Um, eliminated some of the taxes. The people were uh, protected by Roman legions. And he gave Antipater Roman citizenship, which is a huge deal. Even like common people in Rome didn't have Roman citizenship. That came with certain perks. And it was also a way that the Romans um, got leaders to side with them over their own people. So they give this citizenship to the leaders and to the very influential, important people of the conquered lands so that they'll side with the Romans over their own people. So what kinds of things did this mean for Antipater? What kinds of goodies did he get? Well, first of all, he got the right to a fair trial and legal protection. So he could sue other people, but he was protected legally speaking. Um, if he, if there was a court that tried him in a way he didn't like, he could appeal it to a higher court all the way up to Caesar himself. He could not be tortured or executed, which is kind of a big deal to seeing how all of these people were tortured and executed in those days. Um, you can't be crucified if you're a Roman citizen. So that's nice too. You could own property anywhere in the world. You didn't have to pay taxes and you had a lifetime supply of grain delivered to you as a form of universal basic income of Roman citizens. It's a pretty sweet gig. And Roman citizenship, once it's granted to you, then gets passed down to your sons as well. And this would become very important for his 25-year-old son, whom he just made the governor of Galilee, a young man you may know, goes by the name of Herod. He's not Herod the Great quite yet, just Herod the (laughs) 20-something. And we're going to talk a lot more in depth about Herod next week. Trust me, he's kind of an important character in the New Testament. But let's just take a second here and appreciate what just happened in this short span of like 10 years. There was Jewish independence at the beginning of this lesson, but it was really short-lived, only about 100 years, because it decayed from within. Um, In this fighting between Pharisees and Sadducees, between the Greeks and the Jews, between the traditionalists and the contemporary people, and then the Roman Republic, which was at one point a republic, a government of the people, started to become a totalitarian empire and assisted the brothers who were fighting by simply taking over. And the Romans then appoint a politically savvy Idumean by the name of Antipater, who is only in the picture because of his grandfather's forced conversion, (laughs) which I told you was going to be a bad idea, John Hyrcanus. Didn't listen to me. And just like that, They are ruled by an occupying empire and a puppet governor who's not even really Jewish. And all of this a hundred years after we have Judas Maccabee and his brothers who, who zealously saved them from foreign tyranny and restored proper worship of Yahweh to the temple. But boy, howdy. Does power have a way of corrupting even the best intentions, doesn't it? I mean, this is a story as old as time, but it's one that is very clearly played out in this brief period of independence. Also a really good example of what happens when you try to mix religious power and political power. They often end up corrupting each other. And also what happens when the religious leaders are not actually following the convictions that they're teaching others to follow. But 
that's a lesson for us to learn today, I think. Maybe we can stop this cycle from happening. But hey, join us next week. We're going to go much more in depth into Antipater's son, Herod the Great, who, depending on who you ask, is either a sociopathic monster who has all of the babies under two in Bethlehem murdered, or the greatest king in Jewish history who brought about unparalleled wealth, riches, independence, and um, worship of the true God. Depending on who you read and what you believe. So we're going to untangle some of the, the myth, the history, the legend, the propaganda around perhaps the most infamous leader of Judea, Herod the Great. I'll see you next week.